My name is Patricia Lytle, and I'm moderating panel three, Ending the War, How Do We Achieve Lasting Peace and Democracy in Yemen? And just by way of introduction, my name is Patricia Lytle. Um, I am a former, I worked as a communications of dir director of communications for the United Nations Population Fund and for WHO for quite a number of years before doing a series of projects for USAID in Yemen and Afghanistan. And I came out with a book in 2015 called The Hillary Doctrine, Sex in American Porn Foreign Policy, which examined the relationship between the um, security of women and the security of states, which will be quite germane to some of the topics explored in the panel today. <coughs> today, our first speaker is Abdel Ghani, excuse my language, Al Iriani. He's a senior researcher at the Sana Center for Strategic Studies. Speaker number two is Fernando Caravajal. He's the former armed groups and regional expert at the UN Security Council panel of experts of Yemen. The third will be joining us from Istanbul. Her name is Kaukab Altiambani, and she's the 2022 <coughs> W Engage Fellow and the Directory of She for Society Initiative. Our fifth panelist, or pardon me, our fourth panelist is Nadwa Dasari. And she is the non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute. Did I get that correct? And our fifth and final panelist is Ibrahim Katabi. You've doubtless all met him. He is the Yemeni-American political analyst and a senior legal worker at the Center for Constitutional Rights. So with that, I will give the floor to <coughs> um, Dr. Ali Iriani. And again, excuse my Arabic. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. My colleagues have spoken about the difficulties that Yemen uh, is currently living. They've talked about the destruction the war has caused on people and the economy and the infrastructure. They've talked about the intransigence of the Houthis. They've talked about the uh, intrigue of the regional actors and they have talked about the displacement and suffering of the Yemeni people. What I think is the takeaway from that is that it's really difficult to, to restore the Yemeni state. But it's not only that, it's more. Looking at uh, history, the Yemeni history, uh, statehood uh, history is 4,000 years. But statehood was not the default condition of Yemen. Stability was not the default condition of Yemen. Unity was not the default condition of Yemen. So when we talk about restoring the state, we are actually talking about restoring a historical exception. But that's not all. <coughs> if this hasn't taken your breath away, let me add just one more layer. It is not enough to restore the Yemeni state. As it was before the war, Yemen was so fragile that the possibility of state failure was distinctly among, uh, in front of our eyes. Now, with eight years of destruction, it has become even more difficult to imagine a viable Yemeni state post-war. So we really need to restore Yemen to a condition that is better than where we started, where we have seen the failure take place in between 2011 and 2014. We need to have Yemen placed on a path of economic development because, unfortunately, lack of development will mean greater loss of life than what we suffer from in a shooting war. <laughs> Yemen, if we do not do that, will be stuck in the vicious circle <coughs> of underdevelopment and will be 
losing generation after generation. We cannot take a shortcut to peace by compromising these very uh, essential conditions for an end to the war. Let me add more obstacles to our path towards restoring the Yemeni state. Not only do we have uh, a greedy and somewhat ignorant political elite that hasn't developed a vision of ending the war and restoring the state over a period of eight years, but even the UN hasn't developed a vision of restoring the Yemeni state. Their game is we'll get the Yemenis to our room and then they will do whatever they want. Well, that's wrong because we didn't ask the UN to come to Yemen as a caterer, not a master of ceremony. The UN is supposed to be a mediator and they are not playing that role. I've worked for the mission for years and I can tell you that my opinion is that they have not fulfilled the promise of the role as mediators. <clears throat> Add to that, <clears throat> the Saudis are now talking with the Houthis to the exclusion of all the other Yemeni parties. The Saudis are demonstrating the same short-sightedness that we have seen from all the other actors. They want to secure their borders and let the Yemenis do what they might. Well, that's not going to happen. What the Yemenis will do is they will fail to restore the state, will go into a civil war, and we will create ungoverned spaces that will be widely open for terrorist groups such as Daesh or Al-Qaeda. The Saudis will be among the losers, but unfortunately, Yemenis are going to be the first to lose from such a scenario. And I fear that any agreement that is reached between the Saudis and the Houthis to the exclusion of other parties is signing the death certificate of the Yemeni state. I haven't made things so difficult. Let me venture a possible path to the of the I think we can restore the Yemeni state, but we need to start thinking differently. Number one, we cannot continue to demonize the Houthis as we have done today, and I have seen that happen over and over again. <coughs> as they are the enemies of some factions of Yemeni society in war, they will have to be their partners in peace. And we should strengthen the moderates and the pragmatists in the Houthi movement who would be willing to extend their hands to peace. Number two, we cannot demonize Saudi Arabia. No matter what the agreement, whether this agreement is between us and the Saudis, we have to be cognizant of the fact that without close and special relationship between Yemen and Saudi Arabia, Yemen has no chance of economic viability nor political stability. In effect, no chance of viable statehood. We must do all that needs to be done to restore the relationship between Yemen and Saudi Arabia to that special level of, re of relationship where we would be strong supporters of the stability of Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia will be the strong supporter of stability in Yemen. 
Having said that, I'd like to propose a few general principles that would make it possible for us to restore the Yemeni state. And uh, I have only three minutes, so I'll make it quick. Number one is to recognize facts in the ground. Forget about the national dialogue. Forget about what we have decided at that time. It is an important guide for us. But the fact of the matter is we have to deal with facts in the ground. We have to acknowledge reality as it is and then try to, do, to build upon it. We have only three remnants of the state that we have lost. International recognition, the central state institutions in Sana'a, and the local government institutions in every government. So we need to design the restoration of our state, the structure of the state that we need to restore, uh, uh, on these three components. We have no choice of starting new institutions from scratch because it takes time, and we cannot afford that time. <coughs> we also have to accept the fact that the country has already disintegrated. In effect, it is de facto decentralized in every aspect, administratively, fiscally, and also even the security sector is decentralized. Restoring the state means keep uh, establishing basis for stability, and stability comes from balances. So instead of using, uh, looking at the militias as a, an obstacle to stability and peace, we should use these militias to balance each other off by creating what I consider to be the only available option at this time, <coughs> reserve forces at the governorates and opening them for uh, fighters to, to return to uh, from all factions. Those fighters will then serve weekends in the bases, in the military bases, and in the rest of the week they work in the civilian economy. In the two days that they are in the base, they will receive de-radicalization, de uh, vocational training, rehabilitation, and their salary will be considered a social secu <coughs> security program, which then will be upscaled to, con to, uh, to include all factions, uh, all, all parts of the society. If we do that, then we will have formalized what is already in existence and given Yemen the chance to restore its state. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Ariani. Our second speaker is Fernando Carva Carvajal. And again, excuse my pronunciation. Uh, I understand that you would like to speak sitting down. Is this, can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah. Okay, yeah, podiums and I don't get along very well, so if you don't mind, I know everybody can see me and, and hear me. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone, Ibrahim and the organizers for the invitation, Stada Tawak al Karvan. Thank you very much for the invitation, and it's definitely an honor to be able to share uh, the panel with distinguished Yemenis, uh, which is always the priority here in the U.S. and Western Europe outside the Yemen that a general audience, especially students of the Middle East, uh, get to listen from people from Yemen itself and get to listen um, their perspectives first. I don't have a presentation in particular, but I, I'm right, I, we all wrote a paper, so I'll just give you a summary of the paper that I wrote, um, which is titled, Ending the War in Yemen, Which Won? And it kind of ties up, I want to tie up, tie up what Ustad Karaman mentioned in the morning in the opening ceremony, and what uh, folks like Abdul Ghani had been mentioning all morning, all day, in <coughs> being in the U.S., knowing the role that the U.S. is playing. Um, we had the U.S. envoy here. For me, the question <coughs> that comes up as a U.S. citizen, as a, someone who's based in the U.S. and has been studying Yemen for so long, is definitely what role can the U.S. play in ending this war? 
But my paper deals with our demand here in the U.S. and the promise from President Biden when he was in the campaign to end the war in Yemen. And it's basically, for me, it's answering which war that President Biden has promised to end, the war between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia, the civil war in Yemen between the Houthis and the legitimate government, the, north and the war between the North and the South that eventually has been escalating, and which war, you know, the activists in the U.S. and in Western Europe that are demanding the U.S. to end uh, simply by withdrawing the support, the military and intelligence sharing support to Saudi Arabia, to the coalition. Which war do we want to finish? As Abdul Ghani just mentioned right now, ending the war between Houthis and Saudi Arabia is not even step number one. If we really look at what's been going on in Yemen for the last eight months, there have been no airstrikes from Saudi Arabia from the coalition on Houthi military targets or in the north since the beginning of April 2022. Since the end of the UN brokered ceasefire on the 2nd of October until now, there has been no Saudi airstrikes on Yemeni territory. The same with the Houthis. Since April, there have been no cross-border strikes with drones um, on Saudi territory. So we understand that there's a detente between Saudi and the Houthis that they've managed on their own on the sidelines, not really brokered by the special envoy himself. And yet, the war still continues in Yemen. Through the eight months, through the six months of the UN broker ceasefire, you had clashes in Madhab, you had clashes in Taiz, you had clashes in Hodeida, low level, low intensity clashes. The war continues, the suffering continues. There is no opening of ties. When we talk about the impact of the war and the humanitarian crisis, if we merely focus on the city of Taiz, surrounded by, from three sides by the Houthis, there is no access for humanitarian assistance. We heard um, a little in the previous panel how long it takes to travel from Aden to Taiz, from Aden to Sana'a, from Sana'a to Taiz. So for me, the answer to ending, how do we end the war, even before Yemenis start talking about how do we build a state, how do we restore, how do Yemenis restore the state, we need to focus on the Yemeni parties coming back together to the table, talking about how are we going to de-escalate the conflict, how are we going to create peace, how are we going to help 28, 30 million Yemenis restart the economy? That should be one of the top two, three priorities uh, to achieve a peace. If people are hungry, if people have no other jobs other than joining a military force, a, mili uh, a militia, in order to get $150 a month or $200 a month, there is no alternative to that. People, the young people, high school, college students will continue to uh, join this militia or the National Army or the Houthi military because that is the only source of income. Again, to Abdul Ghani's uh, argument, uh, comment on the Saudi Houthi war, from the beginning, from the time of President Hadi in, two, in uh, March 2015, the Yemeni government has been adamantly opposed to direct talks between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia. Why? Because any talks in public between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia, which the Houthis are demanding as step number one for a peace process, it means that the Saudis or the international, the, the Arab, the GCC community will legitimize the Houthis as an authority, as a power in Sana'a. And therefore, the legitimate government of Yemen would then have to negotiate with the Houthis based on the agreement that they've made with Saudi Arabia, with the GCC. So from the beginning, we know that the uh, legitimate government of Yemen, from President Hadi to now the, the political leadership council, has requested that Saudi Arabia keep that in mind. That the first negotiations and the first concessions must be made between the Houthis and the legitimate government of Yemen. And then the Yemeni state, 
whatever, however shape or whatever it looks like, then creates a peace with its neighbors. Um, to, to, to remind you or, or, uh, of this issue or how do you end the war, let's keep in mind that Saudi Arabia and Yemen will continue to share a border for the next 100 years, the next 1,000 years, just as they've done for the last two, uh, 100 years. And, and the security on both sides of the border is priority for both. If there is no security in Saudi, there's no security in Yemen. If there's no security in Yemen, there's no security in Saudi Arabia. So I think that we need to, when we demand that our government, here I'm talking about a U.S. resident as a U.S. citizen, when we demand that our government play a role in the peace process, we need our government to be creative, to be bold, and to understand what Yemenis want from the U.S., and it goes beyond halting all support for the Saudi-led coalition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, that was excellent. Our um, next speaker is Kaukab Altabani, and she's the 2022 <coughs> W Engage Fellow. She is speaking from Istanbul and has kindly joined us today. Kaukab? Yes? The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much for being with me today. And, um, and, it was, um, and I think this is a great time to speak about the difficulties that are facing the society. And I'm here to talk about, um, I'm here to talk about what are, how to engage the Yemeni civil society and women in peace. What are the challenges and what is the way forward? Um, so if we are going to talk about the biggest challenge that is facing Yemeni uh, organization, Yemeni civil society, especially women-led organization, it is uh, the erosion of the state. Um, so if we are going to look how this is affecting the Yemeni civil society, we need to have a, to zoom in to see how this, like how the situation is going on. Um, the the current st the current status of the Yemeni state is that it's eroding, and this is. Uh, faced by the rise of non-state uh, non militarized actors. Um, the Yemeni state is no longer able to function even in the areas they are controlling. And with that, we see that uh, the non-state actors are, um, are the ones who, are, uh, who have the control on the ground, and they are the ones who have the power, and they dictate uh, their conditions. This, um, uh, this has a big impact over the work of the Yemeni civil society because they don't have any, uh, they don't have any um, ground or, let's say, framework where they're able to, uh, to work. The second challenge, uh, challenge that we think um, that it's affecting the work of the Yemeni civil society and also women is the dire conditions on the ground. Um, actually, if you talk to Yemeni civil societies, you will see that there is a host of challenges that are facing them. And um, in addition to that, that there is no state to support their work, there is a lack of funding, extreme lack of resources, and extreme restrictions that it could lead them sometimes to shutting their organizations. And more importantly, for the peace-related organizations, um, they force their agenda, uh, the, the agenda of the dominating actors and the dominating powers are forcing their agenda over the civil society. And as we know, civil society have to be more, to be independent and can work uh, towards people-driven uh, agenda. The other, the other challenges is, the other challenge is that locals women, local women's agenda is missing. And we can see that those who are working in civil society and who is working on the local level, we realize that much focus is on the what we say in the peace uh, terminology, track one and track two, which are higher level of peace negotiations, but the people voices are missing here. And when we're talking about local women's agenda, we're talking about the, those women who are very attached to the people on the ground. So they are missing, their agenda is missing, and um, we don't see enough support for their uh, work on the ground. And it is very important to have this, as many research, as many reports have shown that uh, when women are engaged, uh, opportunities for a sustainable peace is increasing. Um, if we're talking now, we, we, while I think there is uh, there are a lot of big challenges facing the civil society, especially women, 
uh, led organizations. But I think there are um, some opportunities that anyone can build on in order to uh, work for uh, work for sustainable peace. We have like we we do, I will not say that it's complete decentralization, but there are aspects of decentralization because before the, the war uh, regime, there was more centralized around the capital and less focus on the other uh, governance, which lead them to, to be less developed. We see some now uh, governors that start to have more uh, resources, they start to have more uh, local order, that we feel like that this is an opportunity. The second one, which is very important, and I think it has been missed by everyone um, in the peace uh, negotiation, it has been tapped uh, upon, but it's still missing is that the assets and the capacities of the grassroots women-led organization, or let's say, what is their power, if we want to be like more close or very clear. The woman, if we're talking about the most neutral one, when we're talking everyone around this table, or everyone is talking about you have to be independent, neutral. To be honest, those who are working on the local ground are the most neutral uh, group that they can work and the most neutral force that we see them. Um, women working on the local ground are very close from the people and they have the community acceptance and their agenda is towards people they don't care about the agenda of the coalition they don't care about the agenda of the hoods they care about what the people really need they care about how the people people with disability have to access hospitals they care about how children can have um can access education what are the measures that are taken that impact the uh you know uh, protection, the gender-based violence that is, is going, how it's going to affect population. Those voices have to be heard, and these are assets that they could contribute to, to peace. The fourth one, the fourth aspect that I think women, um, local-led uh, organization, is that they are resilient. They're able to have, and they're able to recover and able to find solutions. And if you look at each peace narrative, you see that there are indicators of those who are able to act as peace agent and women-led organizations can be one of those agents. They are conflict sensitive. Their approach is, doesn't trigger conflict. Even if, when they are trying to mediate, they try to, do, uh, to, to diffuse conflict as much as they can. As we said, they don't have any political agenda. They care about the agenda of the people on the ground. While I have said that, I think it's also important to put the strategic measures that we need, that those today who are on the table that we need to consider, is that we need to build the capacity of local, of local grassroots organizations, and namely human rights organizations. And I believe our colleague in the coming section will talk about justice and transitional justice. But from my experience, and I think many others will agree, is that there is almost zero support to human rights organizations, local human rights organizations. And you see them thriving through the uh, current uh, situations. And if we want peace to happen, if we want civil society to grow, we need also uh, human rights organization to be empowered. And this is unfortunately not happening. The second thing, is, the second um, uh, segment of civil society is peace local women-led organizations. They lack the support even if they are supported, they're supported based on the agenda of the donors. And this is not going to help any aspects or efforts for peace, uh, for peace um, and, uh, efforts. And uh, if we are going to talk about the protection of uh, the second strategic action is protection of women peace builders and those who are working uh, in, the, uh, in the civil society. Actually, there is a climate of fear and all parties are attacking uh, civil society, particularly women peace builders and women activists, especially the Houthi group. They have their, um, they are have almost, they are shutting down almost the civil society and they are imposing new measures like uh, male escorts, which are imposing extra additional um, uh, challenges on the people because a lot of women cannot travel and a lot of women cannot go because their husbands are working. So it's not only um, um, agenda, but it's it's also a need on the ground. Excuse me um, for interrupting. The third aspect. We only have one more minute left. Yes, um, okay. I'm about to go. The third okay. aspect is um, 
as the supporting just supporting the lo uh, local human uh, the supporting the human rights mechanisms. Unfortunately, uh, not through you know, the, um, uh, the UN group spirit was very was big disappointment. Though the current national mechanism is important and welcome, but we still need international mechanism to uh, to address the violation and grievances of human rights. Um, local order, we have a bigger support piece. Uh, we see many or many governors that, that there are working and they are operating locally. There's still a chance to fall into conflict, but we have a chance to build the, uh, the sustainable peace from local order without only focusing on high level. We can work in both uh, ways uh, where we can reach sustainable peace. If we ignore local order, I believe future when we talk then to work on uh, the post-war period that have a lot of issues and have another rounds of conflict. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> okay, our next speaker is Nadwa, who is sitting next to me. Welcome. Hi. Um, is this working? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, I think many of us have attended so many meetings, tattoos, talks, dialogues, interviews, trying to figure out how to end Yemen conflict and how to bring peace. And the problem in approaches to bring Yemen peace is that the, the, they, they don't correspond to the reality on the ground. Um, since 2014, the UN envoy has been trying to broker a deal between the Houthis and the Yemeni government to, uh, to accept a political settlement. A political settlement is the de facto tool in the box that we always use. That's been proven um, counterproductive and ineffective time and again. But um, these efforts are divorced from the reality on the ground. On the ground, we have two things. We have the Houthis in the north who have become a powerful military force, um, and they believe that they've ended the war, uh, they've won the war. Um, um, and not because they're popular, but because they, they're faced with fractured enemies. In the South, um, the Saudi-led coalition has completely mismanaged the war. Um, so the Saudis and the Emiratis have divergent approaches, and uh, they back forces that have been fighting each other since at least 2017. They've divided the anti-Houthi forces, and that also played in the hands of the, to the hands of the Houthis uh, militarily, into the hands of the Houthis militarily. Um, the Saudi-led in intervention has led also to a uh, proliferation of armed actors that are not under the command of, and control of any of the parties that are part of the UN peace negotiations. So who's negotiation on behalf of whom? Um, but also I want to talk about the more important he thing here in Washington, the debate about Yemen war, the, deba the debate about how to bring peace to Yemen. Um, the narrative, which I think has been hugely misleading um, and problematic because it did lead to policy decisions that has made Yemen conflict much worse. Um, it's shaped largely by Western groups and driven by agendas that have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with Yemen. Um, it's led by anti-war activists uh, and opponents of U.S. intervention in the world, which is fine. By itself, it's a noble, noble thing. But at the same time, please don't sell that as bringing peace to Yemen. Um, it's also motivated by anti-Saudi sentiment, sometimes. Um, current advocacy in Washington, in D.C., in the West, argue that if we stop selling arms to the Saudis, Yemen war will end. I'm sorry, that's just nonsense. Um, Ending, ending, ending arms sale to the Saudis is not going to end Yemen war. Um, even though the Saudis have de-escalated, de they're now trying hard to 
convinced the Houthis to accept a political settlement with other parties, the Houthis continue to escalate. And we've seen that throughout the truce and after the truce. Uh, but also, ending airstrikes will not, <laughs> ending airstrikes will allow the Houthis to take Marib, which is the last stronghold of the government, and will allow them to expand militarily throughout the country, and that's hardly a recipe for peace. That will bring massive, widespread violence across the country. At least now we have some sort of orderly chaos. Um, so, but the other problem is that the Houthis remain the only party that's not willing to accept peace, that's not willing to compromise, that's not willing to meet other parties halfway or make a step towards a compromise that will bring the war to an end. Um, they continue to, to escalate. Um, they give no concessions. Um, and, and they are not interested in sharing power with other people. The Houthis believe that they are, uh, they have a divine right to rule. They see themselves as the only representatives of Yemenis, and they, they call others, including the Yemeni government, all other parties, they cast them as mercenaries. Um, they have been building their theocratic state, theocratic police state that is extremely repressive in nature to the Yemenis in general, but particularly to women and the minorities. Right now, Yemeni women cannot travel between cities without a male escort in Houthi-controlled areas. The Houthis have prosecuted the Baha'is, they have prosecuted journalists, they have executed opponents. Um, but more dangerously, and this is something we don't pay attention to, this is something we will see it materialize in the next, I don't know, decade or so. The Houthis have been systematically indoctrinating the society. They've changed almost 500 changes, made 500 changes to the school curriculum to instill their jihadist secretarian ideology on our children. And the hundreds of thousands of children that go to summer camps that the Houthis organize every year. Um, they've also institutionalized supremacy. They've, they've replaced government employees and everybody in every important position um, by Hashemites, by descendants of the Prophet, um, to the exclusion of, of others. Um, but why, I'll go back to why this whole you know, argument that if we end support to the Saudis and the Emiratis, it will end the war, why it's problematic, because when you pressure one side, and, and let, me, let me just rephrase that, because, well, the U.S., the U.S. has leverage on the Saudis and the Emiratis. It does not have leverage on the Houthis. This is the reality. We don't have leverage on the Houthis. Um, and we've seen how when we put leverage on the Saudis and the Emiratis and fail to, to pressure the Houthis, what happens? The Stockholm Agreement happened. The Stockholm Agreement was a turning point in Yemen conflict. And what happened in the Stockholm Agreement? The Saudis and the Emiratis stopped the Hodeida operation. What did the Houthis do? They regrouped. They repositioned their forces. They made massive, significant military gains. And now they felt that they won the war. And they're not willing to accept any sort of compromise, even more than before. Um, so exercise pressure on one party. If you can't exercise pressure on another party, if you don't have <coughs> leverage on another party, by default, you tip the military balance in favor of the Houthis. And that's what happened in the Stockholm Agreement. One minute. One minute? Okay. I'll wrap it up. Um, anyway, so there is no simple answer to, as my, you know, the, all the panelists have said, there is no simple answer to Yemen conflict. A political solution, yes, if the Houthis agree, but the Houthis do not agree. Um, a, um, I think we need to... Um, I can talk about solution in the questions of answer. I do have some <laughs> solutions, yeah. but I think we should not expect the Yemen war to end, you know, any time soon, and we should not expect an end that will take time. If, even if we have the escalation, it will take a long time for Yemen to, 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 to um, you know, for the war to end. Um, I think the Saudi-led coalition must be questioned and must be held accountable for its devastating intervention in Yemen. It's made some really bad mistakes. But at the same time, I think that should not be done 
in a way that rewards the Houthis and held and hold Yemen, Yemenis and Yemen hostages to a violent, radical, and supremacist group. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And um, our next speaker, our next and last speaker before we open the floor to questions is uh, Ibrahim Khatabi, Hatabi, and he is the Yemeni American political analyst and a senior legal worker at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Thank you. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think we're here discussing uh, uh, the million dollar question is how to achieve justice, how to achieve um, peace and democracy in Yemen. This is exactly what every single Yemeni wants to see today and the country. The question is how we create the, the, the condition for that kind of peace. Um, today I heard to the fellow panelists um, stating something that I couldn't really let go is that if we need to talk about peace, we somehow need to stop de uh, human um, dehumanizing the Houthis and the Saudis. Demonizing. Hum demonizing. Yeah, um, humanizing the Saudis and uh, we need to humanize the Saudis and, and uh, and the Houthis, and, and, and I don't understand how we're going to do that when the victims of war crimes are done by, the crimes that are committed against the Yemenis are done by the Houthis and by the Saudi UAE-led coalition. We need to hold, to hold people accountable and not the other way around. That's number one thing. Um, and so today, um, while we're talking about peace, the conditions keep getting worse on the ground, mainly because of the coalition and the Houthis and the international community is sleeping in, 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 in bed with them with their idea of going into business as usual. In order to stop what's going on right now and talk about peace, we need to stop funding militias. What the Saudis and the UAE today doing in the South, they're not creating peace. They're not creating jobs. They're not restoring the Yemeni government they, that they claimed they came to restore. They actually created militias, puppets. Loyally, lo their loyalty is direct to the Saudis and the Emirates, dividing and, con and, and conquering the Yemen, committing crimes, damaging institutions, and minimizing the possibility of peace. So in order to, do, to talk about peace, we need to stop that. We need to stop funding militias. And what I mean here, I mean the Saudis, the UAE, international community, there's a UN resolution that says any group that is damaging the stability and the unity of Yemenis needs to be held accountable. These are the ones that are taking place now in the South. Houthis now, from the other perspective, are being painted in the international community as somehow they defend in the land, and that's the wrong idea. Houthis, we all know, as Yemenis, think them of, uh, as them, of themselves as the masters, meaning they the masters of everyone else, secondary citizen, maybe third level citizen, and somehow, for a thousand years, the same exact families been talking about the country, that this is belong to them and everyone else because <coughs> It's second-class citizen because they have God-given rights to control the land and the people. And so right now, today, the conditions that we need to talk about is that holding people accountable, war criminals and corrupt officials. We cannot move forward without doing two these, these two things. We cannot keep bringing warlords and corrupt officials to the table to talk about peace and democracy. That can never happen. And we cannot believe that monarchies in the region will bring democracy and peace to Yemen. This is the wrong idea. This is not going to happen. So the first thing we need to do, it's UN, international community, US mainly. While I agree with Nadua that ending the support to Saudis might not end the war, might not bring peace, but also Saudi and the UAE have gone in the wrong direction. Today we have what, what we call the Yemeni Presidential Council, 
was established in Saudi Arabia without the vote of Yemenis. Don't, Yemenis don't recognize them because a number of them are head of militias created and funded by Saudis and the UAE to somehow lead the Yemeni legitimate government. And this is the problem. This is the problem that created obstacles to peace. So one thing we need to do today is when we talk about justice is hands off Yemen. When we say hands off Yemen, we're not saying everyone should be out. We're saying people who funded militias that divide in Yemenis today, most of the TV channels that are fueling the division between Yemenis run from Lebanon, funded by Hezbollah and, and Iran's, and also from UAE and Saudi. And so these two countries need to be held accountable. And we can't bring world lords to the table again to actually talk on behalf of 30 million people. Let's, let's talk about the Arab Spring. Yemenis women, men, young people, elders, went to, to the streets for a year demanding democracy and good governance, peace, and this is exactly what they still want today. While some others want to, us to believe today that they create in, um, some sort of talk and there is some peace and stuff like that, and the condition has been, the conditions are changed on the ground because there are more militias, and somehow we need to start need to stop, to stop talking about the outcome of the National Dialogue. The National Dialogue, one of the most amazing piece of Yemen's history, in my opinion. Because after the revolution, Yemenis from all walks of life, Houthis, Mu'tamaris, uh, socialists, young women, came together for almost 11 months. Over 500 people talked about peace, about a state, about accountability, about federalism, which is exactly what we want. The problem in Yemen for, for, for decades is that the power have been centralized in the hands of a few. And that created so much problems all across Yemen. And so we have the southern issues, we have the Sada issue, we have so many different issues because the power was shifted all on the top. So the outcome of the National Dialogue was a great outcome. Talked about a federal system, decentralized federal system for all Yemenis. Would Yemenis have access to justice, access, the same access to education, the same access to power, the same access to natural resources, exactly what it is. And that's the conversation we need to have going forward. We cannot have any, any other framework of bringing criminals and, 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 and corrupt officials, and that somehow will solve the problem. That's the wrong idea. We tried it right after the Arab Spring when we gave the Saleh regime immunity and then Saleh with the Houthis is a coup against the Yemeni people. So now, going forward, we need to make sure that folks who committed crimes against Yemenis should not be the ones negotiating, negotiating peace on behalf of Yemenis. I think that's number one. Uh, and so I'll leave it out yeah. there, and then we'll take it. Well, thank you very much.